I think, I, I think there's, there's actually no disagreement. And there are certain situations where it makes sense, especially when you don't have access to other capital or don't have access to other capital at, at, at favorable terms. Strategics generally do pay, uh, do give better terms. So it's understandable. Just one thing on strategics. I think the one place where it is good to take a strategic is for credibility factor. If Intel or Samsung or someone is in your, is in your cap table and you're for businesses mainly when you're selling to enterprises, it helps a little bit. But there's, there's always pitfalls. Just one quick anecdote. We had Intel Capital and AVG, and their classic approach it like a VC investor. They have their issues. But then six months before we went public, Intel itself bought McAfee. And we spent endless hours at the board discussing Intel, what information they could get. So no matter how VC-like they are, there's always that strategic aspect you'll never get away from. Thanks. You've been very quiet, Elon. You, your, your, your turn. You, you were telling me earlier that you are now raising your second fund and that you're looking at cross-border, including Europe, Israel, link up. So the mic's yours and you can answer whatever you want on this question. Sure. Well, uh, our first fund uh, invested in the UK, Germany, Netherlands, about 20 investments, let's say between the A and B round. And what, what we've experienced there that we are really good at making a, a nice US buy strategy of like setting up companies in England, Germany, France, checking the box for the US buyers. So we've done that successfully from 20 investments. We've exited 13 uh, along those kind of routes. Uh, three went bust and uh, five still the portfolio, hoping to do the same trick. Um, and what we've seen actually the last couple of years is that there's way more competition from the downside, let's say the angels are pouring in a lot of money, a lot of syndication going on, angels that made uh, successful exits. Uh, so we don't want to play anymore on the lower field in let's say the two, uh, uh, below two million uh, euro deals. So our sweet spot will probably be the four or five million uh, sweet spot. And we still, there are so many opportunities left in, in Europe, uh, especially the German market where we just opened an office in Hamburg. Uh, there's not so much competition, luckily, uh, to get into the good deals, so we, we noticed. Uh, so there's still a huge need uh, of capital, we'd say, in the Netherlands and Germany, and we definitely think the government can step, step more in, in the Netherlands especially, uh, just an example. Uh, I think this last year, 200 million was spent on venture capital, like not growth capital in the Netherlands, and the Dutch government just announced that they would only do 18 million, uh, and although there is a huge need uh, by the ICT companies to get follow-on investments because the banks are not chipping in at all, so uh, we, we still see that there is a huge need of more capital in the market, and uh, luckily the angels are uh, chipping in uh, on that front. And but what I also noticed with the discussion here before with um, the corporates and having an innovation officer. What we notice in the Dutch market nowadays, it's getting popular, which you already had a long time ago in the Israeli markets. The accelerators started by corporates or in cor corporation with other accelerators. And this is something that's being picked up well, especially by Startup Bootcamp, as you may know that they're also in uh, Israel active, that they're partnering with the big telcos or big banks, because they're, they cannot catch up really with all the innovation that's going on around the world. Uh, so they have to tap into the brains to become more innovative and so on. So just a nice fintech accelerator was started in uh, the UK by Startup Bootcamp, in cooperation with the big insurance companies and big banks, just to see what's, what's happening in there and maybe buy them like in a few years from now. So that's a trend uh, that, that I hear it's a lot happening also on the uh, more uh, side from television, trying to catch up into online video with the multi-channel networks. Uh, that's really interesting to, to notice. Um, yeah, and uh, what would you said, if we're going to invest in Israel, I hope we will, because uh, it's, it's a great country with a lot of innovation going on. Uh, but still, we have to do a lot of convincements of our LPs who are going to invest in our second fund to also agree with that strategy, because they see there are a lot of opportunities still in the in the Europe market, but uh, I would like to have a chat what's ha happening in, with the B round, why there's a gap there, so why maybe we should also get uh, on that stage in here in Israel. I'm sure they all want your business card when we're done here. 
Um, we, we have two more minutes in pick. I wanted to ask you something. Uh, we used to have a hobby here in Israel of trying to compare ourselves to Finland. And in all these comparisons, Finland always looked better, except for the weather. Um, and, you know, we were always asking, how come we can't raise a company like Nokia and, and so on and so forth? And this week we were told that that brand will no longer exist now under Microsoft. And the real question to you has, has, has the changes that have taken place in, in that sector, are they giving, I, I assume there will be a lot of engineers who are out of work or a lot of positions that have been vacated. Part of the way we grew was out of a problem we had here with major defense con uh, contracts being canceled. And that created a whole uh, wave of people who were looking for things to do. Do you see a renaissance or a change in the model in Finland as a result of that? Well, obviously, we can discuss for an hour what happened to Nokia. But just to squeeze that into 30 seconds, uh, I think uh, nothing fails like success. Uh, when it get, gets to your head, and you own the world, and you own the, all the innovations, there's nothing left. So it goes down, 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 and down, and down from there. The, you're quite right, there's a plentiful market of engineers, and now many of those have been tested in the entrepreneurial space. Unfortunately, unfortunately, having worked to a corporation, you get used to the corporate culture. I mean, there's always someone to make coffee for you. You don't need to do these things yourself. And, and so out of these basically hundreds or thousands of people who are on the market, uh, I think there's very little promise uh, for most of them to, to become really successful entrepreneurs. Now, that is obviously a pool for other competitive companies. So, so companies like uh, the Far Eastern companies are starting some, in, some development center uh, and utilize, utilizing that talent. But I think that the, the one thing that sets Nokia apart is that, was the thing that I started with, that they felt they had all the innovations in the world. Craig Barrett of Intel uh, once told that Intel, like Cisco, they bought, they acquired anything that moved because that was the only way a corporation can really innovate. Nokia failed to do that and it cost them their life. Thank you. Well, there's, there's always a lesson to be learned. I'm told by our Master of Ceremonies that our time is up, so I'd like to thank all the panelists for making it out today and all of our participants. Thank you very, very much. We're going on a well-deserved coffee break. Alex, until when?